perfect. I was stalling, but here walks in Dr. Ponce. So I think that's all the go ahead that you need, Sarah, right? And Meg will come right yeah, over. She'll be okay, over. Yeah. perfect. I'll turn it over to you, Sarah. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. And thank you for taking time with us, Dr. Ponce. Um, I am so happy to have you here and to do this live stream for DBS. Um, we're excited to hear about the updates and what's happening, uh, what's new and about sleep um, for DBS. So before we get started, I'm going to just read a little bit about who our two speakers are today. We have Francisco Ponce. He's a neurosurgeon at Barrow Neurological Institute. He earned his undergraduate degree in physics at Harvard University, attended graduate school at Oxford, and medical school at the University of Chicago. He completed his residency at Barrow Neurological Institute at Dignity Health, St. Joseph Hospital, and he received a subspecialty training in stereotactic and functional neurosurgery at the University of Toronto. In 2011, and has published extensive PBS and neurosurgical procedures in peer-reviewed medical journals, and I can tell you personally, having heard him before, you are in for a treat being able to learn from Dr. Ponce, and I'm sorry about the echo here, um, and after Dr. Ponce, we're going to hear from Meg Lambert. She is the DBS program coordinator at Barrow Neurological Institute. She serves as program developer, patient liaison, and clinical and educational coordinator for patients physicians, and other team members. She also coordinates research activities for DBS, and he, she's worked in an RN, as an RN um, supervisor for surgery department and has multi-specialty surgery practice um, as a practice manager. She's the daughter of a person with Parkinson's and has a personal and professional interest in helping improve the quality of life of patients undergoing DBS. She's a wealth of information. Uh, and many thanks to Medtronic for helping to make uh, today possible. It's so important to get information out about treatments and uh, ways that people can continue to you know, reclaim their lives and um, live a full life in spite of disease. So I'm not gonna talk anymore and I'm gonna pass it on to Dr. Ponce. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks for everyone who's tuned in. Uh, I'm Dr. Ponce, this is Meg right here, and um, I, I think we're going to talk a little bit about just deep brain stimulation in general and kind of the path we've taken to getting to where we are right now. Um, the uh, history of deep brain stimulation uh, kind of originates with the uh, attempts to treat Parkinson's disease. So actually, I'm going to go a little bit further back than I anticipated. I'll go back to the 1910s. Uh, as far back as then, you know, think about Parkinson's. Uh, at first, when um, the original paper came back, came out in the 1800s, uh, it was called the shaking palsy, and it had no treatment. They described it like, all right, this condition, let's give it a name. We're going to call it, you know, it was James Parkinson, so he, he got his name associated, affiliated with that condition. And they had the description, you know, the shaking, the, the, the stiffness, the slowness, and, but there was no treatment. And it was like that for like 100 years, and then in uh, the 1910s, was when they started doing the initial treatments for Parkinson's. And these were surgical procedures um, where they would actually ablate parts of the spinal cord to stop the shaking. Um, but the, there's, a, there's a cost associated with cutting the spinal cord and that can be paralysis, right? So, uh, so that was the really early days of, uh, of, of surgery. And from the 1910s until the 1950s, these surgical procedures evolved. And uh, a very common operation or a, uh, a uh, go-to operation for Parkinson's uh, in the 1950s was called a pendunculotomy, where basically they're cutting uh, a part of the brain. Uh, it was a very uh, invasive operation. And um, uh, Irving Cooper, one of the fathers of fun functional neurosurgery, uh, in 1952 uh, accidentally uh, cut a major artery during this operation and aborted the operation, stopped the operation uh, because he had taken that artery he was not able to complete the operation. And when the patient woke up, lo and behold, his rigidity was gone, his tremor was gone, and it was kind of an aha moment uh, at that point, uh, seeing that a stroke caused by damage of this artery could treat Parkinson's. And so he switched kind of the ge his gears from doing these pedunculotomies to doing uh, ablations. He'd ablate, he'd uh, ligate uh, the anterior choroidal artery. Um, and it turned out that this operation was very inconsistent. Uh, some people would wake up with their tremor improved and their rigidity gone, and others would wake up paralyzed. 
So there's still that inconsistency and that was an issue. And it was actually Irving Cooper who kind of proceeded with the next iteration of uh, managing Parkinson's with surgery, uh, which was basically a more focused, uh, tailored uh, ablation, destru destruction of the brain um, that was not as, uh, as much of a gamble as taking this major artery. Um, so that was, uh, that was uh, back in the 1950s and through the 1960s, these uh, pr uh, procedures were refined. In the late 1960s, uh, levodopa was introduced, um, carbidopa levodopa, uh, and that's, uh, that was a, 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 a eureka moment, you know, it was the medical miracle. Uh, people got control of their Parkinson's in ways that they had not before, um, and really during the 1960s um, and much of the 70s, all of a sudden Parkinson's went from being something that went towards surgeons to being something that was managed medically. Um, one of the issues uh, with uh, levodopa therapy, uh, where a lot of the attention went in the 1970s, was that people who had done really well with levodopa therapy started noticing that they'd have to take their medications more and more frequently. Uh, they'd have dyskinesias, these kind of squirmy movements like ants in the pants dance, uh, where they would, uh, they, they would have these side effects of medication. And you know, we have patients even today that take medication seven times a, a day. So these were basically chasing the symptoms. They'd go from being, you know, with their symptoms controlled throughout the day to having these ups and downs during the day and having the squirmy effects. And all of a sudden, there was a renewed interest in surgical procedures because of the limitations of levodopa therapy. Um, so in the 1980s, uh, surgical procedures took off again, but it turned out that um, uh, we were still doing ablation. So ablation is when you destroy the brain. It's called a thalamotomy. That was a very popular uh, operation. And when you do an operation like this, knowing that there can be some inconsistency or variability between one patient's anatomy and the other patient's anatomy, uh, for the purpose of safety, and because we weren't exactly sure where in the brain we needed to be, we needed the feedback of the patient in surgery uh, with them being awake. So we could say, you know, watch the tremor and make sure the tremor actually stopped and looking for side effects. You know, or is there numbness? Is there weakness? Because once uh, you cannot unring that bell, once you destroy the brain, you can't go in reverse. So there's a lot of steps that were incorporated for the purpose of safety. Uh, with these patients, uh, with this operation in the 1980s. And this was before um, uh, deep brain stimulation. The other thing is that when you do an ablation, when you destroy the brain on one side and you do the same thing on the other side, you get side effects that you wouldn't get if you only do one side at a time. Uh, and so for that reason, it was considered a contraindication to do a lesion on both sides. So people would basically, they, they, they'd have to choose an arm, you know, usually the right hand if they're right-handed. And so you'd only do a unilateral one-sided uh, treatment. So the first DBS patient was somebody who had undergone a thalamotomy on one side and wanted the other hand treated. And um, uh, the surgeon basically looked at how the operation was being done saying, well, before we make the ablation, what we do is we actually use electrical stimulation to mimic the effect of the lesion to make sure indeed the tremor is gonna stop and make sure that there's no problems, no side effects. In the 1980s, they were using electrical stimulation in surgery uh, to make sure they liked where they were before they went past that point of no return. Um, so the aha moment on the part of uh, Dr. Benaby, the first neurosurgeon to do this kind of DBS, was to say, why don't we, in effect, adopt cardiac pacemaker technology to make a brain pacemaker, so a chronically implanted device to provide electrical stimulation, because they already did that electrical stimulation work. And so the first DBS was basically a workaround on a patient who could only get one side ablated, destroyed, to get the other side treated. And that was using the information they knew from awake surgery, that brief stimulation with electrical stimulation could mimic the effects of the lesion. So, um, so the need for awake testing was because this is abl ablation, um, but as we transitioned from ablations to neurostimulation, we adopted a lot of the same techniques we used, you know, small hole at the top of the head, wires being placed that we used with um, ablative surgery, we used with, uh, with, with the early years of deep brain stimulation. You know, keep in mind at that time too, um, the, uh, we weren't necessarily sure where we needed to go. So we were recording cells, listening to the cells firing, thinking that good cellular recordings would predict good outcomes six months after surgery. Uh, now, so kind of bring us back to dead A, over the past 25 years, a lot of technology has happened. You know, we have MRI studies that weren't ubiquitous at the eight, late 1980s, 
and we're just kind of taking it off in the 90s. Now it's a dime a dozen. All of our patients, if they can get an MRI, have these beautiful MRIs that we can see all the structures of the brain. Um, so we have MRIs. Another thing that's becoming more and more ubiquitous in the operating room are forms of CT scanners. You know, we use CT scanners all the time to do spinal surgery, to put spinal, you know, rods and screws. We're using intraoperative CTs all the time. And we're able to incorporate those same CT scanners that are being used for spine surgery to perform deep brain stimulation surgery. So um, we've got the surgical technique. You know, I think we've gotten a little bit better. We're more efficient or we have lower infection rates. Uh, so as things have evolved, because of these decades of awake surgery, our understanding of where in the brain we want to be and our ability to visualize that area on an individual patient with current MRI technology has advanced. Um, so we're not where we were 30 years ago. So how do we incorporate all this, 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 this progress in how we actually perform the operation you know, versus doing this, the operation the same way we were doing it in the 1990s? Um, so so that, that's how the surgery has evolved. And meanwhile, we've been uh, looking at the um, penetrance of deep brain simulation itself. You know, think about deep brain simulation as being uh, brain surgery for quality of life. You know, the FDA recognizes that DBS improves quality of life. Well, you know, who wants a, dro a hole drilled in their head, right? So, um, so, you know, this idea of balancing the risks and the benefits and what it means to have a neurostimulator implanted for the rest of your life, that's a big deal and that's a big process in the patient's journey uh, to DBS. And um, not only have we seen DBS being underpenetrated, but the FDA actually recognized that even more patients stand to benefit from this therapy than uh, they once said. So in the 19... Uh, 90s, early 2000s, they're saying advanced Parkinson's. Uh, a few years ago, they changed that description of who is a candidate uh, to patients who have had the disease for four months or four years. So four years of Parkinson's that responds to levodopa and at least four months of kind of chasing those symptoms with more medications or adjusting medication because of dyskinesias, about fluctuations. If you've been chasing these symptoms for at least four months and you had at least four years of disease, the FDA says, you're, you're a candidate to consider a, a deep brain stimulation. So that's a pretty early line in the sand, but also just kind of emphasizes how underutilized this can be. You know, it's cost effective. Uh, it's not a treatment of last resort. It's not experimental. You know, I always tell my patients now, this is nothing new, but it's new to you. And that's something that we try to address with patients through, uh, through education. I think a big challenge always is, you know, we rely upon a neurologist to kind of give the green light so far as the indication goes. You know, we talk about medical risks and the risks of the operation, but they're the ones who say, this is, a, this is Parkinson's disease, uh, this is not Parkinson's disease. And you know, if a neurologist doesn't incorporate this therapy in their practice, that'll also limit an, a, a patient's access to this therapy. And I think that's always why it's important to kind of see a movement disorder specialist who knows how to incorporate this therapy among other therapies in their armamentarium for how they uh, try to reach the goal of managing uh, symptoms. Um, you know, so we've, uh, we've kind of looked at the goal of both increasing the accessibility of this therapy, increasing the penetrance of this therapy in our market, in our state, uh, with um, uh, leveraging the progress in the last 30 years uh, to reassess what our goals are in surgery and what we need to accomplish those goals. And the bottom line is the way we approach this operation is say, all right, we, have a, we, have a, we feel pretty confident where we want to go in the brain. We can see that with an MRI scan, and we have the ability to make sure that indeed through that hole about the size of a dime, about four and a half inches deep, that we actually did hit that bullseye within two millimeters. We have the ability to verify that within. With Thank you. I'm Everything else, you know, the, the, the crutch of being able to see a tremor stop, you know, what's the, what's the need for that when ultimately what I want to know is I hit the target that I picked accurately. And that's kind of been our evolution. We've been doing a sleep surgery. That means surgery under general anesthesia uh, for about six and a half years now. And I've treated over 850, 840 new patients uh, over the course of my practice, and 80% of those I've done uh, with a patient asleep. Now, when I say asleep surgery, it, it's, it's not a, a necessary and sufficient condition for the way I approach surgery to have a patient asleep. The bottom line is the principle of asleep surgery is that I'm picking my target on the MRI, and then I verify using the CT scanner and surgery that actually I hit my target. And as long as I've got, I've got an accurately placed target, our data shows that we get the, the results we expect. 
Um, so we've actually had patients who are very sensitive to anesthesia. So they've actually been awake in surgery, but we're not doing all these testing. We're still relying upon the proof with the intraoperative scanner that we hit our target uh, to say, all right, we're, we, we accomplished our goal today. Um, and I think that attention being driven from uh, you know, the awake testing, the recordings of the cells uh, to the MRI has kind of allowed us to refocus on obsessive attention to the MRI quality, uh, the targeting on the MRI, uh, the surgical technique itself, and maintaining accuracy of our system. And our goal really, I think, as we've ex uh, experienced uh, doing DBS in this setting, has been um, uh, uh, consistency with our outcomes, not having this variability. You know, some people end up here, some people end up there, but really kind of standardizing the operation so we get very consistent outcomes so that the, what you get when you go through surgery is predictable. And I think that has rendered this operation more accessible so that patients who have kind of gone through this journey of weighing their options and learning what it's like to live with Parkinson's uh, don't find themselves kind of in line to the scary roller coaster in the last minute thinking, you know what, thanks but no thanks, I'm gonna walk right through to the exit, but rather saying, you know, this is not that bad, this, this is not that bad of a ride, it's not a scary roller coaster, sign me up for this. And that's what we've seen kind of driving uh, the growth of this therapy uh, in, in the greater Phoenix area. With that, I'll let Meg no, take the stage. <laughs> but what, how I want to comment on the sleep procedure that Dr. Ponce has been doing for the last six and a half years is um, whenever I talk to patients and I say, if you had a preference, what would you choose? No one wants to be awake for the surgery. And uh, I'll share with you some of the reasons why people would not have wanted to undergo DBS therapy if it was awake. Think about patients who have had, let's say, a car accident. They have chronic neck pain, chronic back pain. They're in a fixed position in the OR, can't move, and cannot have any pain medication to relieve any of their discomfort for four to six to eight hours. So if you are one of those patients who say, no, no, I'm not doing that surgery. So that is one example of a patient who would really benefit from DBS who may not have wanted to undergo the therapy if he had to be awake. So we can um, offer this therapy to a multitude of patients. I'll share with you something personal. I'm highly claustrophobic. The thoughts of me being in the operating room, again, for four to six to eight hours with a frame on my head, not being able to move, I would say, no, 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 I'm not having that. I can't do that. I can't bear it. So for someone like me, if I had to undergo DBS, I'm just thankful that we can do it under the sleep technique with Dr. Ponce. Um, Dr. Ponce talked a little bit earlier about education. One of our big goals here at the Barrow BBS program is educating our patients. We have a two-hour class that I teach every Monday morning. Anybody is welcome to come. You don't necessarily have to be one of our patients. You are welcome to come at any time with your family and your friends. And we teach it from 10 to 12 every Monday here. And I go through what is DBS, how we determine if somebody's going to be a good candidate, what is the surgical procedure, what is the post-op course of events, and a little bit about the programming and frequently asked questions. So I just want you to know that that's available to you. One of our other goals here at Barrow in our DBS program is to um, knock down barriers for access to care. So we have a dedicated DBS, I call it the hotline, and I actually answer the phone. And we have a dedicated DBS email address because some people are, they just don't want to speak, but they're more comfortable emailing. So we address questions from all over the United States. And I get phone calls from all over the United States. Even one night when I work late, I got a call from a gentleman in Alaska asking about a sleep DBS. And sure enough, we made all the arrangements. He came down here and he's doing great. So I wanna let you know that if anybody has any questions whatsoever, I'm available to answer those questions. And if I don't have the answer, well then I go to Dr. Ponce. Um, the other thing I wanted to let you know is that um, during the hospital stay here at Barrow, we are very accommodating to families. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but nurses go back to school and get various certifications in different kinds of specialty areas. I happen to be what's called a CNRN, a Certified Neuroscience RN. Here at Barrow, at our hospital on the campus of St. Joseph's Hospital in downtown Phoenix, we have the largest number of CNRNs working here in the nation. 
So when you come to us, I can assure you that you're getting neuroscience care. Uh, we have 24 operating rooms here and 12 are just for neurosurgery. And there's no cross-pollination of staff. So when you come to us for surgery, you're getting expert care from neurosurgery specialists. Anywhere from neuroanesthesiology to our neuro operating room staff to your recovery staff. And then where our patients go postoperatively is our neuroscience tower. They're staffed by CNRNs, etc. And we have large private rooms in our neuroscience tower with accommodations for families to spend the night. We're also um, very mindful of the needs of the hospitalized Parkinson's patient. And that is huge. It's just huge. So um, what we do here is we ask our patients to bring their Parkinson's meds with them in the original bottles with the labels and bring your personal medication schedule. Because we all know your doc can write a script for Cinemet 25 over 100, four tabs, you know, a day. But you are given leeway depending on your symptoms how you're going to dispense those meds. We want to know how you take your meds. It's very important to us. Dr. Ponce writes in order, patient may take meds from home because we want you to get your meds when you take them and how you take them. And many times certain drugs are not on the hospital formulary and we don't want to mess up your medication schedule. So we have made a huge effort here to accommodate our Parkinson's patients. Another thing we put in place in the hospital is we have in our electronic medical record, we have um, prompts. So if someone goes in and writes a medication that's a contraindicated medication for a Parkinson's patient, for example, Haldol, um, it flashes in red, contraindicated med. So we have all these safeguards in place to make sure that your hospital stay is as safe uh, as possible for you. Now, typically our patients, this surgery is done in two separate stages. The first part of the surgery is when Dr. Ponce places the leads in those targets in the brain. And the patient will stay one to two nights in the hospital and about 98, when you say 98%, go home. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a couple of situations where the patient might have to go to rehab, but 98% of the time patients will spend one to two nights in the hospital and go home, directly home. Then they come back about 10 to 14 days later as an out patient, and that's when Dr. Ponce will put the neurostimulator or battery in the chest and connect it to those wires in the brain. The patient does go home that day. Um, Dr. Ponce closes with staples, so we give you instructions on how to take care of your staples at home. We give you your instructions before you even have surgery. We have custom discharge instructions that we provide for you when you leave. And you also have me giving you a call at home to make sure everything's going well. Now, we ask that patients have at least five days worth of supervision available to them at home following surgery. The reason is following any kind of brain surgery, you could have what we call a hit or a concussive-like state, like you've been playing football and got whacked on the head. That's a clinical term. So, um, you could have word finding difficulties, short term memory, vagueness of thought, and for safety's sake, we just want somebody to be at home with you for the first couple of days. You won't be able to drive for several weeks because after any kind of brain surgery, your processing is a little bit slower. And for safety's sake, you're not gonna be able to drive until one of your doctors says it's okay to do so. Um, this is not a painful recovery. This is an uncomfortable recovery. Most of our patients are off any kind of narcotic on the third day after surgery when they can shower. And if they need anything, it's usually just Tylenol. Uh, some of the precautions following surgery, we ask you just to use common sense. Don't put yourself in a position where you're gonna fall and hit your head, like don't go up a step stool or a ladder and don't walk a 100 pound dog who's gonna see the bunny and pull you down and your head's gonna hit the curb. And yes, that's happened. So um, the other thing about DBS surgery is we want you to move. You're not gonna be a couch potato at home. We encourage you to go out and have a walk, stay hydrated, and always wear a hat because you don't want sun exposure on those incisions on your head. What else can I tell you about your post-op course? Um, you will come back in, like I said, for um, your battery to be placed about 10 to 14 days after the leads are placed. And the only precautions following that particular surgery is we ask you not to do any push, pull, or lift greater than 10 pounds. 
pillow for just a few weeks because you don't want to put any undue pressure on the incision on your chest. And the other thing, and ladies, listen up, we ask you not to put any hair dye on your head for at least six weeks following surgery because you have healing incisions and you don't want to put chemicals on your head. So get, just get your hair done the week before surgery. Some other um, precautions that we have is we ask you not to submerge in a pool or a hot tub or a creek or a lake for approximately six weeks following surgery because you know chlorine doesn't kill everything and while you're healing, we don't want to introduce any bacteria or algae into a head wound. Oh, speaking of the head, this is very important to remember. Dr. Ponce is one of the few neurosurgeons doing DBS who does not shave the head. All we do is clip a little bit of hair where he's going to make those incisions where the wires are going to be placed. So uh, that's a huge consideration for people, believe it or not. What else? What else? Um, yeah, no, it's, uh, you kind of covered that part. Yeah, we, we actually, you know, when we're evaluating a sleep DBS, uh, you know, the, the biggest, the big metric we use in medicine is a randomized controlled trial, which in effect is like flipping a coin and saying, you get surgery, you get awake, you get asleep. And during our first couple of years, people were like, doesn't matter, I'll do either one. Uh, and as soon as we finally got that, uh, that trial approved, uh, all of a sudden, patients were like kind of flexible, dried up. Everybody was just like, I want to I sleep. And still, when I, when I have patients come in and I say, look, if you look on YouTube, you Google, you know, DBS, you're going to see people, you know, playing their flute, you know, playing the banjo, guitar in surgery, and that's not how I do it. You're going to be under anesthesia for my operation. With, for, that's what you sign up for with me. And, um, and everybody's like, no, nobody's asking. It's like nobody's asking to be awake anymore. So what happened was about three years, it's almost three years ago now, I went from kind of mixing it up with a sleep and awake and going through things you know, the, the risks, advantages, or kind of considerations. Um, three years ago, this fall, we kind of went to all asleep um, just because we had uh, gathered enough data that it was, it was uh, supportive, uh, that, you know, basically couldn't find a difference between the two. And, um, I, I, and now, you know, patients are like, yeah, no, I, I hear you, doc. You know, we're, we're here for, we don't want to be awake. It's just like what Meg said at the very beginning. Um, people don't want to be awake. Even people who, you know, come in saying, you know, I, I wanted to be a doctor when I was in high school and I like science and I'd like to be awake. That's the one that Meg's talking about, that they're complaining about their back the whole surgery, their back hurts. You know, we can't make them comfortable. So, the, you know, the, these are all kind of why we've kind of, again, streamlined it, standardized it, kind of say, all right, we're, we're kind of doing it this one way, same operation each time. It's not going to be this kind of variability. Uh, and I think that standardization is what really helps optimize uh, and uh, maximize uh, uh, outcomes and minimize uh, complications. Uh, even the, the things like, you know, we look at circuitry, um, you know, we always uh, you know, are trying to prevent bleeds in the brain. Everything's rare until it happens to you. Um, infections and hitting the right target. Those are like kind of like the eggshells that, uh, that I think about at the time of surgery. And um, standardizing the technique really uh, enables us to minimize those risks. Dr. Ponce, tell the audience how long a case takes under general anesthesia versus an awake case. Yeah, so... Um, uh, so the, the operation typically takes between 60 and 90 minutes. Um, you know, uh, at St. Joe's, it's a teaching facility, so sometimes, you know, that extra 15 minutes is part of the teaching uh, process. But, um, you know, it's, it can be as small as 15 minutes. In fact, uh, when I treat just one side, those operations can be as, 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 as quick as 30 minutes. But it's not because we're rushing through. It's, just, it's more efficient steps. I mean, this is an operation, I know, like the back of my hands. We know every step uh, has its place. And you put them all together, and next thing you know, it's uh, you're done. And I think the, the benefit there is um, one is minimize exposure. So you know, exposure corresponds with infection risk. Uh, we don't want to be there all day. Um, and the other thing would be uh, you know, minimize the loss of spinal fluid. The longer the head is open, the more spinal fluid we're, lo we're losing. The more air it gets in the head, and the more recovery is associated with getting getting through that speed bump. Um, you know, one of the reasons we kind of uh, stopped doing awake was because uh, there's actually kind of a convergence in terms of how we're do doing the operation anyway. One, we do some cellular recordings and we do um, some testing, but we'd still hit the same spot because our surgical technique uh, was basically equivalent so far as being accurate. Um, so it, it became the same operation, just, you know, a, a different steps, but we weren't really making adjustments uh, based upon awake patients. So our, our, our awake actually became, <laughs> uh, now we know what Meg has for her uh, ringtone. It's my husband, um, <laughs> sorry. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, 
uh, so our, our awakes actually became pretty efficient too. Um, you know, but you know, the, the guys who in other facilities, they're like, oh no, you can do DBS here. We don't want to do DBS. Uh, they, one, one, one team called it the eight hour burr hole. So the, the, where you'd spend, you know, six to eight hours through a small little hole surfing around looking for that right spot. Um, but I think overall, play, for example, places that do both awake and asleep, their times have decreased on both ends just because they, they, they kind of know what they're looking for. And it doesn't take, you know, six hours to find that spot. Um, so the, the, the operation, you know, as it was being done in the 1990s, uh, is much more efficient today. And I think kind of the attention we have on detail that's kind of driven a lot of the steps toward a sleep have also been adopted in awake surgery. So that in many centers, you're, you're seeing this, this operation being done more efficiently on all fronts. But I think when, when you know what you're looking for, uh, it kind of, it, it takes out a lot of the, the fiddle factor of trying to figure out, am I happy with where I am or not? Is it because the patient's not awake enough? Should I, should I record another set of cells? Uh, all those factors I think have contributed in the past uh, to the variability of how long this operation takes. Oh, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, frequently asked questions that I get from patients, if you don't mind. Um, number one, the number one question following this brain surgery that I get from patients is, what do I do at the airport? Isn't that, isn't that amazing? The number one question. So here's what you're gonna do at the airport. You tell the TSA that you have a pacemaker, which you do, it's a brain pacemaker because the TSA probably doesn't know what a neurostimulator or a DBS device is. And I tell my patients in class that you can't go through the security gate because you have metal in your body and you will set it off and they are gonna wanna wand you. You have to avoid being wanded following DBS surgery because if they hold the wand over a prolonged period of time, it could give you a jolt and turn your device off. And when you're rushing to catch a plane, you don't want that that to happen. So you just say I have a pacemaker, so either get a pat down and make some new friends or go through the body scanner, which is x-ray and perfectly safe for you. Uh, another question I get frequently is what do I do with the dentist? Well, you don't need any antibiotic coverage. That's just fine. The only thing we caution is that you know how they use those ultrasonic scalers these days? We just say make sure the hygienist keeps it away from your battery. And no good hygienist is gonna put her equipment on your chest, I would hope. Um, the other question I get is about cardiopulmonary resuscitation. What happens if my loved one clutches their chest and falls down at the mall? What do I do? We say, save a life. Let them do CPR, let them use defibrillators. You know what, if they're doing CPR and they kind of break something, we can fix it. Your life is most important. So never, never, never turn down cardiopulmonary resuscitative measures when someone has a DBS device. Um, some other questions I get are, what kind of medical tests and treatments are safe following DBS? Well, um, MRI. We have um, several devices on the market, but um, we do have safety protocols in place for those that are MRI compatible, and we take it very seriously. So we have those safety protocols in place for the devices that are MRI compatible, and we can help you out with that if there's ever a question on where and when and how you can get an MRI. The other, um, the other considerations are there's two therapies you cannot have following DBS surgery. One is called TMS, trans um, magnetic stimulation. It's done for patients with clinical depression, and you're sitting in an MRI scanner for a prolonged period of time, and it's too much exposure to magnetic stimulation because you now have metal in your body. So that's, that's something you cannot have. And the other thing is a therapy called... Um, diathermy. Diathermy, thank you. Diathermy is deep heat. It's typically reserved for professional athletes, but you might come across it in a PT office or a chiropractor. What happens with diathermy, it heats up the muscles and the deep tissues, and it could heat up the wires that go to your brain, and that is uh, no bueno. So those are the two things that you cannot have. You can have CAT scans, x-rays, fluoroscopy, um, mammography, all those things are safe. Um, one other thing to remember, I was talking about the airport, is the security gates. Once you have a DBS in place, you also have to be mindful of courthouses, sporting events, concerts, the big security gates that are looking for weapons. You're okay at Target, you're okay at the library. That's not gonna set anything off, but again, Avoid security gates, tell me you have a pacemaker, and have a pat down. And 
we've had no problems from any of our patients regarding that. Um, I think that's pretty much, I've covered all the things to consider following surgery. That's great. Um, thank you so much. So much information. And by the way, just so everybody knows, we're recording this. So we will be putting this on our YouTube channel. So you can always watch it, rewatch it, and rewatch it because there's a lot of information in here. Um, there was a question about how does awake surgery affect recovery versus a sleep surgery? Does that impact recovery? So we actually looked at this. We've, we, have, we wrote an article on this. The, um, the, I think the one concern would be whether the general anesthesia uh, has, an, has an effect where it delays recovery uh, when you do it asleep versus the, you know, using less anesthesia for, for awake. And we did not find there to be a difference. So, so we looked at that. But yeah, they, there's a difference in terms of, you know, kind of having a twilight versus uh, being completely out. You know, the goal with awake surgery is that at some points the patients are kind of snoring through when we're drilling, when we're putting the frame on. Uh, things like that. Um, but no, we, we've, we've looked at hospital stays following uh, asleep versus awake, and we do not see a difference. And we always Great. caution patients, too. If they are um, a patient that has a history of nausea following surgery or anesthetic agents or narcotics, to please discuss it with our neuroanesthesiologist prior to surgery. And they have a whole host of things they can do to prevent that postoperative. Perfect. Um, is there a difference in how sur the surgery is paid for a sleep versus awake? Um, are both covered equally? Yes. Okay, yeah, that's the code, good the code that they use for reimbursement is the same. Okay. Um, and is it all in one or is it a two-stage surgery? Two-stage surgery. So um, the leads are placed and you know, you, you, the vast majority of patients I do get two sides, some do one side, and then they come back okay. two weeks later. And while they're under anesthesia for the second stage for the battery, we take out the staples from the top and we have two new incisions at that point. Perfect, okay. Um, this is great. We're getting questions coming in, so I'm reading them to you. Some of them are sent privately. Um, people can send it to everybody or privately. Let's see, following the surgery, is there a period of brain swell and what effect does that have? Yeah, so, um, so there can be some swelling. Uh, the, um, so the mechanism of swelling, so we, we talk about this honeymoon period that people have with their symptoms, like their tremor goes away and they're, they don't have the battery yet and their tremor's gone for like two weeks. And that is from swelling. That's from, a, that's, we call that a micro lesion effect. Um, so just by that a relatively atraumatic process of putting the, uh, the, the wires in, there's actually trauma. I mean, it's a brain operation. And on one hand, you see the tremor stop. Now that's at the deepest part of the electrode. On the way down, you can also get swelling. And in fact, we, we can see some kind of swelling as often as 10, maybe even 15% of the time. And usually it's not symptomatic. But sometimes, and you, we start seeing this happen about 36 hours after surgery, about a day and a half. Some people can develop uh, some speech or even a seizure. Uh, you know, these are all kind of part of the, the risks of the operation. So among that sort of, uh, area of like 10 to 15% of swelling, a proportion of those patients are gonna have some, can have symptoms and that can include a seizure. That can, we even saw a patient with some aphasia uh, and those we, we expect to improve just with time. It's patients, um, you know, sometimes a little bit of steroids and it, it just runs its course. But, uh, but some swelling can happen. Sometimes it's good with the honeymoon period and sometimes uh, it can cause a side effect and uh, with that we just wait through it. Okay, that makes sense. Any surgery has some of that. Um, so there's a question about, is there an age range um, that people can have this? And is the age range the same for asleep versus awake? Uh, age range is the same for asleep versus awake. Um, I think the, the same reasons why we might, uh, might uh, be reluctant with the general anesthesia with the higher risk older patient is also why we might uh, have less control uh, if they're awake. In fact, one of the things that we used to see with awake would be we'd have to wait for, you know, several minutes, 10 minutes for blood pressure to get under control. We don't have blood pressure problems when under general anesthesia with awake patients, you're kind of balancing sedation versus being able to test them and, and you start seeing blood pressure issues. So we've not seen uh, a, uh, age being an issue so far as awake versus asleep. And um, so far as age range, we've had people in their 80, 89, if we had in our 90s, 94, 94 yeah. was a patient. And the youngest was seven. Yeah. So, um, wow. So, 
I, a lot of that depends upon, so if, if it, the 94 year old, for example, um, I want their family to be in the uh, evaluation. It's not just the 94 showing, showing up saying, sign me up, you know, make sure that the whole family is on board with the decision. Cause you know, we have patients who say, look, my parents lived until they're 100. I plan to be uh, alive for at least five more years, and I don't want to live these years with this problem. And I, mm -hmm. I read them the Riot Act, make sure they know, you know, this is surgery, it can have risks, um, uh, you know, set, set appropriate expectations. Uh, but, you know, 80 is not the same 80. You know, there's young 80s, there's old 80s. So if somebody's a high medical risk, we'll counsel them against surgery. Uh, but like I said, that 94 year old, uh, it's, you know, it's not what we're looking for, but it's quality of life. And if they are planning to be around for several more years, they don't want to live those key years with a severe uh, disability that can be treated. Uh, we make sure they hear what the risks are and the alternatives. Um, you know, there's, there's other ablative options to consider as well. Um, but usually our neurologists love DBS. And so oftentimes if there's not a huge medical contraindication uh, and uh, the patient knows what they want and they have family support, uh, we're, 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 there's not a, a hard age cutoff. There are quite a few other programs Perfect. in okay. the United States that do have age cutoffs. They, but here at Merrill, mm -hmm. we look at the individual patient, like Dr. Ponce said. And one of the key things is we tell our patients, we would like you to be in overall good general health. However, because it's elective brain surgery, and that sounds bizarre in and of itself, right? But um, <laughs> if a patient is under the care of a specialist, we reach out to the specialist and we get their clearance of that patient ahead of time saying, we want to do elective brain surgery on your patient. Will you clear this patient? Are there any medication restrictions, et cetera? So we work closely with the specialist just to make sure that we're doing surgery for the right patient, like Dr. Ponce said, who's um, in fairly good medical health. Okay, great. And there's a question about, um, is on-off testing required before surgery? Yes. Uh, one of the indicators that DBS is going to be successful for a Parkinson's patient is seeing whether or not they are still responsive to medication because the best uh, response to DBS is the patient's best response to uh, medication. So think about when your meds are on, like totally on and you're feeling the best that day. That's how DBS is going to make you feel. If your meds are no longer working for you, DBS is unlikely going to help you. So on-off testing, for those of you who don't know what it is, we have patients come in off their meds for 12 hours. We do a 22-step motor function exam, tapping the fingers, opening and closing the fist, walking up and down the hallway, and we score it. Zero is the patient has no difficulty with the task. Four is the patient's symptoms are so severe they can't complete the task. And there's all these little variables in between. So we score it and then we have the patient take their meds, wait till they kick in and we repeat the test. And what we're looking for is a 30% improvement in those motor scores, those motor function scores. And that gives us an indication that that patient will likely respond to DBS. Now the only uh, area where we take that into consideration as a guideline is tremor predominant patients because we all know there's not a whole host of medications out there that help with tremor reduction. So we take that into consideration when we're doing that 30% improvement. Perfect. That was a great um, description, by the way, of the on off uh, testing. It was the clearest I've, I've ever heard. So, okay, let's see. Done about 350 to 400 in my career, Sarah. Because <laughs> <laughs> you do it all the time. <laughs> well, it was great. Um, so let's see. I don't want to miss any questions. Um, Somebody asked about this neuro testing. Parkinson's. Yeah, I'm trying to see. I don't see one yet. Um, well, there's a question about how is Parkinson's different from essential tremor in terms of this, I think in terms of DBS. Um, it's, this is for Parkinson's, how is essential tremor different? So um, uh, Parkinson's is, uh, you know, the entire brain is affected in Parkinson's. Um, there's, there's different stages of Parkinson's, you know, stages one and two stages. And, and what, we're, what we're treating with um, levodopa is kind of the stage three and four symptoms. And that's the stiffness, the slowness, the tremor. Uh, those are like the, the cardinal three features, but that's not all there is to Parkinson's. There's, you know, 
sleep disorders and losing smell and constipation. And then later on, there's uh, cognitive problems and um, balance issues. So what we're really focusing in that, those middle stages, and, um, and the tremor is a resting tremor. You know, it's, it's when people write, they write very small and at rest, they're, they're, they're shaking. But when they start at doing things, the tremor uh, goes away. Um, and it's a progressive condition. So, uh, you know, we always say deep brain stimulation is not disease modifying, and it's specific to those uh, sentiment responsive uh, circuits. Um, essential tremor is a benign condition. People, you know, have, they like, hey, they called me shaky Joe in high school kind of thing. You know, people have had it for their whole life or uh, they have family members who've had it and it's an action tremor. So at rest, they're not moved, they're not shaking, but as soon as they kind of grab a glass, they start moving around with the, with the glass in their hand. Uh, so it's, it's an action tremor. And so when they're trying to make a circle it's, or write their name, instead of writing really small, like with Parkinson's, uh, they're shaking all over the place. Um, so there's the, the target that they initially started using for Parkinson's back in the 1980s uh, was the thalamus, and we still use that for essential tremor. But in the 90s, we found out that there's other targets that we can treat not only tremor, but also the stiffness and the slowness associated with Parkinson's, any symptom more or less that responds, any motor symptom that responds to levodopa uh, will respond to DBS at these uh, nodes that we do for Parkinson's. Uh, whereas for essential tremor, we use a different node uh, where we wouldn't see the rigid and uh, the stiffness and slowness melt away, uh, but we do have excellent control of tremor. So it's a different node that we modulate in the circuit for essential tremor compared to Parkinson's. And essential tremor patients okay. don't have to undergo on-off testing, but what we do in the office is I do a tremor um, rating on them. It's a series of evaluations that I do and we come up with a number, but it's not necessary to do it. We just do it and then we do a 12 weeks post-op because we want to see the reduction in tremor in those kinds of patients. And I have to tell you, in today's um, world of insurance, many insurance companies now are asking us for that tool, it's called a FON, to see how severe the essential tremor is before they will approve the surgery. So that's why we do it. But we don't, it, it's not a mandatory thing. It's not gonna give us an indication because we look at essential tremor patients in a holistic manner. You know, somebody could come to us and say they weren't approved in another program because they told them, in essence, your tremor's not bad enough. But nobody actually asked that patient about their quality of life. For example, if they are a jeweler and they're setting stones and have that fine little tremor, you know, that's their quality of life. Maybe to the visual naked eye, it looks like a mild tremor, but it's really affecting them. So we have different sets of parameters with that patient population. And like Dr. Ponce said, it's vastly different than the Parkinson's patient and the whole host of symptoms that go along with the disease. Okay, and I'm gonna combine a few questions here. Um, there's questions about um, how does this affect the symptom and progression of Parkinson's? Does it reduce symptoms like fatigue and can you stop medications? So, um uh, you can reduce, so there's different targets we use for Parkinson's, and if the priority is to reduce medication, there's a target that actually, in the 90s, the definition of success with DBS was this ability to be uh, reduce medications. So we do see uh, the ability to reduce medications quite substantially. Um, the, um, uh, it doesn't modify the disease, so you know, the disease still progresses, but the benefits of DBS remain for the rest of your life. So we know that those effects don't wear off and there's not really an advantage to waiting. It's not like, you know, uh, the, the benefit of DBS is going to be more in 10 years if you wait 10 years to get it. If you get it now, it's going to have the same benefit in 10 years, except that, you know, the quality of life issue, you haven't become decompensated over those 10 years of uh, progression. Um, let's see, what's another question that we had thrown out right there? Oh, you, I think you got, oh, the medications. Will they go off medications? Oh, yeah, just, just reduction. It's, it's a reduction, yeah. um, you know, not having to take it seven times a day, you know, cutting out. Uh, some people do get off medications, but that's, um, uh, that's not the, that, you know, I promise over deliver, right? That's not going to be something we right. pitch beforehand. I actually okay. pulled 50 random charts recently and looked at Parkinson's patients prior to surgery and six months after surgery. And just in these 50 charts, just 50 random charts, I saw an overall 27% reduction in medication. And that's just from 50 charts. So that's wow. pretty significant. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
Well, and you've kind of talked about um, the benefits and how long they last and that, you know, they, they don't go away. They're not, they're not time limited. Um, there are a few questions about how prevalent aphasia is and is it more prevalent for someone who had speech issues before surgery? Are you sure they want to know about aphasia versus dysarthria, which is a change in your speech following My hunch is that's what they want to know about. If I'm wrong, go ahead and type the question back in. But because of the follow-up, my hunch is it is the speech. Yeah, we don't, aphasia would be, uh, it's a rare situation where the swelling might result in a speech issue and that we expect result. But yeah, let's talk about dysarthria. Mm -hmm. uh, aphasia is the absence of speech. Let's talk about, let's, let's dysarthria. Dysarthria is, uh, I want you to listen to my voice. It's a sunny day in Sun City. This is dysarthria. It's a sunny day in Sun City. You see the difference in my voice? All of a sudden it's soft and it's a little bit slurry and sometimes it'll, it'll, it'll uh, reduce at the end of a sentence. That's dysarthria. And sometimes following DBS surgery, if you have both sides done in particular targets and to minimize your symptoms, we have to crank it up really high. Sometimes you can experience some form of dysarthria. About 50% of the patients do report that they have a little bit of dysarthria, but I have to assure you that we have mechanisms in our toolbox of programming that we can do to kind of program around that phenomenon and those symptoms. And then there's verbal fluency that we see with bilateral, with, with Parkinson's. Right. And part of Parkinson's is speech. And so sometimes those networks can be affected by stimulation. So uh, for verbal fluency. Verbal fluency is the brain's ability to categorize in the brain. So Sarah, for example, if I said to you, Sarah, in the next 60 seconds, I want you to name as many words as you possibly can that begin with the letter R, go. So your brain is categorizing. Or I'm gonna say, Dr. Ponce, in the next 60 seconds, I want you to name as many instruments that you find in the OR as you possibly can, go. See, he's categorizing items. That's verbal fluency. And they say approximately 20% of patients that are tested by neuropsych six months after surgery show a small tick down in verbal fluency scoring. However, less than 5% of those patients actually notice a difference. So verbal fluency is not speech per se, it's the brain's ability to categorize items. That makes sense? Makes sense, okay. Yeah, and I would imagine that there's a certain portion of that that can be just tied to the Parkinson's and the change, you know, in the brain, I would think also. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's true, but we've seen that that, that could be. Is, I've time. heard the neurologists say that too. They're like, well, you know, this is part of the Parkinson's and, you know, mm -hmm. you can see some, we, we, we have had, uh, some patients with pretty significant effects on their speech. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it, it's rare. And, um, uh, but, and again, it kind of comes along with the, the circuits that are affected. Sure. Okay. Um, there's a, a person who says, I have a very minor leg tremor. I have stiffness, rigidity, slow gait, and movements, horrible handwriting, stooping, shuffling, and freezing. Is DBS indicated for my symptoms? So um, Probably need to see. That's a good one, right? Yeah. yeah that's a, the, the, the short answer is uh, be evaluated by a movement disorder specialist. Um, you know, the, I'll take this opportunity just to say, uh, the handwriting often does not improve. So that micrographia, the small handwriting, is something that um, uh, uh, often does not respond to, to DBS. Um, you know, a, again, a home base I always use with patients who've already kind of gone through the process. When they start asking me questions, I always say, does it improve with medication? And that's home base, right? And they're like, yeah, it does. Well, then it's, it probably is, it's likely going to respond to DBS. And when I say medication, I don't mean any medication. I mean uh, carbidopa, levodopa, dopa-based medication, things that are uh, affecting the levodopa, dopamine circuits. So if it responds to medication, it's likely to respond to DPS. So we Perfect. think about that with freezing, for example. There's freezing that happens in the later stages. In those patients, you know, it's the levodopa doesn't help with freezing. It's unlikely that DBS will. There's other patients who freeze, and it does respond and improve when in their on state. So in the on state, they're not freezing. And for those patients, uh, DBS is likely to help. Okay, great. And I think we have time for one more question, and I have one more that I believe I haven't 
uh, read, but I do want to just kind of put a little plug in there too. As Dr. Ponce said, it's really important to be evaluated by a movement disorder specialist. Um, and a movement disorder specialist is a neurologist with advanced training in Parkinson's and movement disorders. So they're like a specialist of a specialist. Um, and they are, you know, they really have a deep understanding about uh, Parkinson's disease and um, we partner with them. There's many movement disorder specialists um, where Dr. Ponce and Meg work. Um, and you can always visit our website for some, uh, you know, references of where movement disorder specialists are. Um, but it's, it's great to link up with a, um, a movement disorder specialist. So you have a good evaluation and make sure that you're, you're correctly diagnosed. Um, so I always like to put that plug in. Um, one last quick thing, and I think you kind of touched on it, but just to put a little bow on this wonderful hour that has been rich with information, um, the disease benefits and impact of the progression of the disease with DBS. Um, I think you talked about like the quality of life and that it's, it's not necessarily going to slow the disease, but can you just... So, so far as I, uh, uh, so when you say quality of life, you know, um, one of the things that happens with disability, it's not something that happens overnight. It's insidious. It happens over time. You know, people gradually stop going out with their friends as much or, you know, going and doing fun things. And the relationships at home can even evolve into kind of a more patient caregiver relationship. And so, you know, this happens over, over the course of years, uh, you, know, un, you know, not working anymore, you know, not going out as much. And all of a sudden, you wait that long and then you get TBS and wow, look at that effect. You know, the wow effect is huge because, you know, you've had this, this decline. Uh, but over that time, uh, you know, you've kind of become socially deconditioned, uh, not taking the garbage out or doing the dishes or folding laundry. And now that you can, you're not about to, or now you're trying to make up for lost time. So I think that there's a social deconditioning that happens during that insidious process of disability that, you know, optimizing timing can help. Uh, stabilize. Uh, and I think that's been one of the goals in addressing the underpenetrance of DBS and not treating it as a treatment of last resort, uh, but rather making it accessible uh, through both neurology and through uh, uh, safe and uh, consistent surgery uh, to patients who stand to benefit from it. And what I like about DBS therapy is as the disease progresses over time, you can adjust the programming to match the change in the symptoms. Do you know mm -hmm. there are 15,000 different configurations we can do if somebody has both sides of the brain done? So we can just manage those symptoms as the disease progresses. And that's what I like about the therapy. Oh, that's, I had no idea there were 15,000. Yes. Wow. Um, this is just been amazing. And Meg, do you want to just say a quick thing about the follow-up that we're going to do with this? I would love to, Sarah. Um, as a continuation of today's a DBS journey, the PMD Alliance is excited to announce they will be airing a follow-up live stream with two local Arizona DBS ambassadors who were implanted by Dr. Ponce. Please mark your calendars for Wednesday, October 3rd to hear the local Arizonans, Patty Meese and Brian Baer, share their personal journey with Parkinson's disease. They're gonna talk about how and when they made their decision to have DBS surgery and their lives after DBS surgery. We also want to extend our appreciation and gratitude to the PMD Alliance and all the incredible work they have done and continue to do for the Parkinson's and movement disorder community. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thanks, and, Sarah. And Thank you. Thank you for, for what you do. Oh, it is truly our honor. And thank you for taking time with us today, you know, to share this important information. And we're really grateful for your partnership. And again, thanks to Medtronic to help me make this happen today too. Um, just a lot of learning. And for everyone who is on, we will send out a link and let you know once we have it up on the YouTube channel. And we'll also include in there how to reach Dr. Ponce um, so that you know how to uh, get in touch Get in touch with him. So thank you all so much. Have a wonderful day. Sarah, they can go on the barrowneuro.org backsplash DBS, and we have a dedicated phone number and an email address in the event that anybody has questions. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a wonderful day.